Hello everyone, my name is Hugo Cornelis. Welcome to Here's the Execution Plan. Now what? Part 1. So, you probably know when you have seen my content before or when you've watched, or when you've watched me speak that I love execution plans and I love teaching. So I do a lot of teaching in execution plans and I hope that people learn from it. But there is a one problem that people have when they are learning about execution plans. Not just for me, basically always. So let's say that you are trying to learn execution plans and a teacher, me or someone else, explains something. In order to explain something, we simplify it. So we come up with a really simplified, clean example to t show you just the specific issue we want to discuss, and then we give you all this information that we want to give you about this specific situation. And you pay attention, and you are like, ah, now I get it. I understand how this works. I have learned something. And then the next day, you are at your work, and you brag how much you learned from attending a conference or watching a YouTube video or whatever source you had for learning something, and your boss now thinks you're the execution plan expert. So when your coworker has a performance issue, he asks you to go there and help that coworker. And you, full of confidence, approach the coworker and say, Show me the execution plan. And your coworker shows you the execution plan, and you're like, Oh, that's not how they looked in the classroom. This is actually quite complex and I have no idea where to start. This video, or rather this series of videos, is intended to bridge that gap to get you from those very simplified classroom examples to reality by doing some examples that are somewhere in between. So we will show <clears throat> we will show sample execution plans that are for realistic scenarios, not completely simplified, but not too complex, a medium complexity to get you one step closer to the reality of the execution plans you will see in your work. In this video, I'm going to talk about the excessive I.O. case. There are more cases, those are for future videos that I also plan to make, but this video will show you how you could deal with a scenario of excessive I.O. So let's stop talking and let's jump right into the demo where I'm going to show you just that. So here's the situation. You tr have been told about a store procedure or you found a store procedure that causes excessive I.O. Maybe the DBA found it and asks you to fix it. Maybe you found it yourself and you need to fix it. Anyway, you know that there is a store procedure, sales by regions, that causes too much I.O. And this needs to be fixed. So let's just first take a quick look at the execution, at the query. And it's fast enough. Well, we weren't asked to fix the speed. We were asked to fix the excessive I.O. So, in this relatively small database, even with excessive I.O., it is really fast. But let's look a bit deeper. So, let's start by looking at the store procedure. So, we have a store procedure called Sales by Region. So, I'm going to go to the Object Explorer, connect to the database, and I find it, it's in AdventureWorks, it's in the Store Procedures tab, Sales by Regions. And I'm going to click Modify because I'm lazy. I could click Script as Alter to New Query Editor, but Modify does the same thing. So I just click Modify. I'm not going to actually modify it. This is just so I can check the text. And what we have here is a Store Procedure, and wow, we have a comment. But the comment is rather cryptic. Someone wrote this and they probably thought it made sense. But this is something you will have in your real work. You will have bad comments in your code or no comments at all. In this case, we have a comment. And if you read the entire text, you see that there is a sales order header and address. So someone described that there is a join from sales order header to address, then to state province, and that this has to be done two times. 
And then there's this join, and now I suddenly understand that this is probably short for SP, state province, ST, sales territory. So this is the short form of this. And this comment says, someone who wrote this store procedure realized we have the same query multiple times. Instead of doing that same query multiple times in a single, or the same join multiple times in the query, I am going to do it once and save the results because I think that will make the store procedure more efficient. Is that correct? Is that incorrect? I don't know. At this point, I don't care. I only want to know the excessive IOs because that's what I am paid for. This is also something you need to learn. When Once you get into optimization, it is so tempting to optimize everything. But you don't need to spend a half hour or hour to optimize something that nobody cares about because then you're wasting time. <coughs> so let's look at the store procedure. So we have a table variable that is used to save the results of a join of sales territory to country region. We see that here, it's stored there. Then we have another table variable that is used to do this triple join. And because we already have this sales territory to country region in this version here, we reuse that table variable here to get the results of salesperson to sales territory to country region. For some reason, that same method could have been used here to do the address to country region join, but it hasn't. Another place where perhaps we could optimize, but I'm not going to do blindly things. I want to know why we have excessive IO. Then there's the actual query where we do some data, we get some data back, and we see all those table variables used here in the join. And we have a selection on the country region name for either the bill region or the ship region or the salesperson, or all three has to match the supplied parameters. Okay, cool. This is the text of the store procedure. I don't immediately obviously see a problem, but we have the text, we know what the store procedure does. Where do we start? Well, we could ask for the so-called estimated execution plan. And those who know me know I don't like that term. I call it the execution plan only. So let's ask the execution plan only for, that's the wrong tab, for executing this. So click for execution plan only, drag the slider up, and we see that all the logic of the store procedure, let's put it up a bit more, as multiple steps is there. So you see all the execution plans for each statement in a sequence. But there's no, it's nothing immediately screaming at me saying, oh, this is where there's excessive IO. Yeah, I see things that cause IO. But which one is excessive? I don't know. So maybe we should run the query with some additional data. So now I'm going to ask for statistics IO and statistics time. That is given on a per statement level. So when I execute this, I can see in the messages a lot of stuff. And this is all the data we need, but it's not really hard to read. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to select it all, copy it, I'm going to start a browser and I'm going to go to the statistics parser. And if I type it right, it should be one of my first stored results because I Google this all the time. And I go to this, I, I probably should bookmark it. Um, I can paste this here. This is uh, written by, I think if it's by, yeah, Richie Rump has written this, made it available to the community. It's awesome. You just paste the output of set statistics IO and set statistics time here, you click parse, and what you get <coughs> is the same data more readable with easy totals added. So here is the total for the first statement, we just have 32 logical reads. That's not excessive. Second statement, 17 logical reads, not excessive. Third statement, 62. Okay. The fourth statement, hey, here we have 163,000 logical reads. And that's also the last statement. So here we have the totals of all statements combined. Sometimes that's useful. In this case, I'm going to stick to just this fourth statement where we have 163,000 logical reads. That 
is the excessive part. So even though we saw some weird stuff in the first three statements and had our doubts, is this smart? Is this not, not smart? We were right not to waste time on this because we were asked to look into this stop procedure for the excessive I.O. And the excessive I.O. is completely in this fourth statement. And apparently 163 logical reads, almost half of that comes from a work table and the other half from the product table. So the rest is peanuts in comparison. It's mostly the product table and the work table. So now we know a bit better where we need to look. So let's run this same store procedure again, but now with the execution plan plus runtime statistics, also known as uh, actual execution plan, enabled. So we get our results, we get of course the same statistics I.O., but now we also get the execution plans for each step. I'm going to skip the first three. And here's one more thing I do want to point out. Here we see in query three, I'm going to zoom in, this is query three that we know does almost no I.O. Here we see that it's 57% relative to the batch. In one of my other videos, uh, execution plans, where do I start? I talk in more depth about this, how confusing this percentage can be. This is an estimate, this is not reality. In reality, this number is completely misleading. This third query is not the problem. The 57% is misleading. It's a bad estimate. Reality is that all the I.O. is caused by query four. Even though it says 41%, this is where all the I.O. is. And it is on a work table and on the products table. Do I recall that correctly? Let's just flip back here. Yes, the product table and the work table. So now I need to look at the execution plan. And I'm just going to go through it and look at things. And one thing I notice is that there are some of those yellow triangles here. That was, sorry, that was uh, those yellow triangles. And if I hop out of the zoom and hover my mouse there, you will see that those triangles means there's a warning. We used tempdb to spill data. That is the work table. So there is data being spilled to work tables in tempdb for sorting data. There is also a spool. Spools always use work tables. So there's also a spool that uses a work table. This spool is needed because if we go back to the text of the store procedure, then this last final query, we have multiple count distincts here. In order to do a count distinct, SQL Server has to remove duplicates. But once you have removed duplicates, you have changed your data, you still need the full data for the second count distinct. That's why in this execution plan, we have a branch. Come on, do what I want. We have a branch on top that does the normal aggregation. And then we have two branches below that, each with a distinct sort that removes duplicates and then does a count distinct based on data from the table spool. So this is where a lot of that data from the work table comes from, the sorts and, of course, those table spools. But we also had the products table, and we see that the product table has is used in a clustered index seek. It would be nice if you, yeah, there you go. So we have a clustered index seek where we have an, an estimated number of executions of 3.8, but the actual number of executions is almost 40,000. And it's a clustered index seek that is executed this often into a nested loops. B and why is this done? Because there is a misestimate on the results of that nested loops. SQL Server thinks that only four rows will match. In reality, 38,000 rows match. And that, I, I'm not even going to look that much at the rest because we already know that's not where the excessive I.O. comes from. So now we have found, by first looking at the set statistics I.O. to see which query in the store procedure and which tables in that query cost excessive I.O., now we have found the specific operators. Now we need to do something about this. 
Now we use table variables and you should know that table variables have no statistics. That is sometimes a benefit and sometimes it is not. In this case, I'm going to go back to the execution plan. We had an estimate of just four rows. The reality was 38,000. And now I do need to go to the far right side because all the data comes from these table variables that have an estimate of one row. And for instance, this table variable in reality has 8,668 rows, but the estimated number of rows was just one. And that bad estimate is just propagated through the rest of the execution plan as it joins to other stuff to this estimate here of four that is completely off and that causes SQL Server to choose a bad execution plan. So the obvious choice if you have table variables that always, almost always use an estimated number of rows of one and that causes a bad execution plan, the obvious solution or fix is to use uh, temporary tables instead. That can introduce new problems because temporary tables have their own issues. But in this case, it might help. So what I have done is I copy and paste the text of the store procedure. If there's a change log, I will, of course, add it to the change log. But what I've done is instead of doing declare table variables, I create temporary tables. That's the only change I've made. Even the stuff that I saw that was su uh, suspicious, I didn't change it because I want to isolate this change and see the effect. That's the only way to really know what we are doing. So I'm going to alter the, uh, the, the, the store procedure. And if this is in production, I would create a new store procedure to verify the two. But we're on a test environment. I can just alter the store procedure. I can always restore from production. No problem. So I alter the store procedure to use temporary tables. And now let's check what happens. So I'm going to execute it again. We have our results. And let's first copy all the data from the set statistics IO, go back to the query window and open another statistics parser window, paste the new data here and compare the total. So I'm just going to scroll down to the totals at the end, far end. So this is for the entire store procedure. Now the original, I'm also now going to scroll down until the end. So we had, before we changed anything in the original store procedure, we had an overall total of 163,000 logical reads. We have already reduced that to 87,000. That's a huge reduction. Those 87,000 are still almost all from the last query, and it's almost all the work table. Let's look at the execution plan that we had to see if we can do even more. So I once more going to skip the first queries and just going to focus on the last one. So we see that some things have improved. We see that there are still table spools because we have this distinct stuff. Some sorts don't spill anymore, but some sorts still do. These two sorts still have this warning symbol and this message that there is a spill. Why is this spill here? because we still have a bad estimate. Yes, the estimates are better. If you go to the far right, we see that the estimates from salesperson to country code is correct eight. The, sale, the estimates from the other tables are correct. We have no nested loops into the person's table anymore. With hash match, we have better uh, data. But at the total end, we still have a bad estimate. We have an estimate of 1,502 rows going into the table sp uh, spool, while in reality it's 38,000. And that low estimate of 1,502 causes these sorts to allocate insufficient memory, which causes the spill. We need to get a better estimate. So why do we have this bad estimate? This one took me some time to figure out, but I checked and I saw, we, we scan all the salesperson to country, we join that to sales order header, and remember we have a filter on there as well. And that filter is then applied um, 
I don't uh, know exactly. Uh, so this filter is applied here. Here we have a predicate that says we only want the, jo uh, the rows that have the correct salesperson region. So we get eight rows instead of the 14 rows that were previously stored in this temporary table, which means that of the 31,000 rows from sales order header, we lose a lot of rows that are not in the correct country. Then we have a remaining number of rows, estimated to be 1,895, in reality 2,436. And we repeat the same pattern of joining to another table that also uses a predicate now on the bill region. And we once more lose rows. But in reality we don't lose rows. You see that the actual number, 2,436, 2,436, 2,436. It doesn't change. The estimate goes down 1895, 859, 390. So why does this estimate go down and the reality does not go down? Why are the estimates wrong? That has to do with the fact that we filter on bill region, ship region and salesperson region all in the United States. And it makes sense that if you filter on one of these to only orders that are shipped in the United States, that probably almost all of them are built in the United States and done by a sales person that's working in the United States. That's full correlation or almost full. There might be one or two exceptions, but 99% of orders that are shipped in the United States will be also built and sold in the United States. So those filters are very correlated. But SQL Server has two options depending on which cardinality estimation model you use for how to deal with multiple filters. One of them is no correlation at all and the other is partial correlation. No correlation at all would for instance be it's sold in the United States and the amount is less than 10. There is no reason to believe that in the United States the amount is always less than 10 or always more than 10. Partial correlation might be um, uh, sold in the United States and there uh, is a symbol of the American flag on it somewhere. I think that products that carry uh, a symbol of the American flag will be sold more in the United States than elsewhere, but it's not full correlation. There is no way to tell the optimizer, assume that these three predicates are fully correlated. We cannot tell the optimizer that. So the best way to get this bad uh, uh, estimate out of the way is actually to split the query in this case. So what I have done in this case, once more change the store procedure, the start is the same. I use the same temporary tables. That was a change that worked, so I'm going to change, keep it that way. But now I'm going to create a new store temporary table, selected sales order headers, that only finds the sales order headers that match those three regions. And then in the actual query, I use the selected sales order headers and don't filter anymore. So it's the same logic, but I've split the query in two parts. Let's change the code. And then execute this again. Execute. We get our messages. Copy it. This was the second attempt. This was already bad. I'm going to reuse this window because I don't want to keep opening new windows. I could do that, of course. But now I'm going to look at the results of our split query. What do we see now? Well, there's now five statements. So I'm going to go straight to the totals, and now the total is 85,000. The total was, let's move down again, 87,000. So we did reduce the number a bit. Not much, but a bit. Maybe not what we hoped for, but let's look at the execution plan. Now you see that in the fourth query, this is where we apply those filters. And you see that same bad estimate where we expected 390 in the estimate, but in reality there's 2436. We cannot fix that bad estimate, but by putting the results of that bad estimate in a temporary table, 
we have ensured that the next query actually will use this correct estimate. You see the exact correct estimate of, whoops, that was a misclick. I'm sorry for that. You see the exact correct estimate of 2436 row pop up here. And that means that the rest of the estimates, while still not totally correct, is much closer to reality. So we reduced the logical I.O. a bit. But what we also did was we reduced, we removed all the spills. So there's no spill anymore. And spilling always slows down a query. It wasn't our task to optimize this query. Our task was to reduce the I.O. Spilling causes I.O. We saw the reads. We didn't see the writes. SQL Server doesn't report the writes, but there were writes as well that spilled to TimTB. All of those are gone now. We're not writing to a work table anymore. We're not reading from a work table anymore, at least not as part of a spilled sort. We do still have the writes to the spool. We cannot change that. Why can't we get rid of that? Simply because we need those multiple count distincts. If this query is still causing too much I.O., if our DBA tells us or our monitoring tells us this is still a number that is too high, we're causing issues on the problem, on the system, we need to do something about it. Yes, obviously. That will be very hard. There are ways, but they are very hard. In this case, if this 70k logical reads caused by the table spool is still a problem, my first impulse would be to go to the end users and say, do you really need these numbers? That may sound weird, but I have experienced over and over and over again that sometimes fields are removed from a dashboard, but nobody tells the SQL guy that they don't need those column in the data anymore. So we just keep producing data that is not even used in the front end. Or maybe an end user will say, yeah, I like it, but it's not really relevant. If it's costing that much, you can remove it. If we really need this user requirement, if it's not negotiable, then there are ways to get around this, but they are hard and they are beyond scope of this video. Now, I didn't fix everything. I pretty sure that those temporary tables for performance are not really good for performance. Based on what I understand of SQL Server, I wouldn't jump to the conclusion that doing that once and then storing the results is actually a smart idea. So perhaps we should use CTEs or just use it in the query. If we do keep the tables, those temporary tables, maybe we should index them. That might help. But that's not what we were asked to do right now. We were asked to tame this store procedure and to reduce its I.O. We did just that. We got to a point where we say we have 70k logical reads that are directly caused by the requirements. We cannot change that without either negotiating or spending a huge amount of time to do something very smart. Is this sufficient? Is 70k sufficient? Then we're done. Is 70k insufficient? Then we need to do that next step. All those other optimizations, yeah, they might be smart. They might be interesting. If we ever have time where we have nothing to do, we might look at this store procedure and just, just optimize it to make sure we do something useful with our time. But right now, I have eight more tickets waiting for my attention. I have reduced the logical IOs of this store procedure. That was my work. That is the reality of working with SQL Server. You don't optimize just because you can. Of course, if you have time, you do. But if you're busy, you optimize where you should optimize. Perhaps you have questions. You can always mail me or you can leave them in the comments and I will try to answer your questions. If you liked this video, then please click the like button. If you want to get an alert when I create more videos, hit the subscribe button and YouTube will arrange that. My name is Hugo Canelis. I love execution plans. I thank you for your attention. Goodbye.